Kelly, first of all, thank you, because uh, I've been following your work for ages. I remember the first Supple uh, Leopard that came out. And also, you are the person that um, I like in the way, because you're a cool dude. Like, you're you're keeping it, you know, you're keeping it real. And you implemented, because I'm, I'm finishing it my, my last year of chiropractic, so I've got one more for, to become an intern. But... I'm also a strength conditioning coach. I work with professional athletes. And we're trying to combine both because they were like, oh, I'm a physio. Oh, I'm a coach or I'm a PT. And you brought all this together, which is really important. Uh, I think it is important. You know, I, let's just take for a second that the field of PT is not that old, right? The early yeah. rehabilitation medicine, uh, chiropractic is a little bit older, you know, out of the osteopathic traditions. But you know, if we look at really the, the advent of modern strength and conditioning, 20, 25 years, I mean, really yeah. serious. So 20 years ago, it was really difficult to get good information. Maybe you stumbled into Pavel's work. Maybe you were an Olympic track and field coach and you would read or you knew someone. But, you know, it was really impossible to be an expert in gymnastics, an expert in nutrition, an expert in sleep and recovery and adaptation, an expert in, in movement and Olympic lifting. And suddenly... Whoa, that looks like what my mom does at age 70 at her local gym. Yeah. You know, and so something has changed. And the, you know, the I, I want to just be clear that people have been obsessed with solving and improving the human condition yeah. for as long as there have been people. People have been obsessed with lifting heavy weights and running very far for a long time and throwing things very far for a long time and wrestling for as long as there have been human beings. <laughs> Some of that, some of that tradition really came out of some of the military science, right? The Prussians really looked at temperature and load and, you know, duration. Um, so there, there's a lot of, let's not pretend ourselves that we're the first people to care about. So our task, and if we look at the masters in front of us, looking at trigger points, right? Chevelle, looking at Brian Mulligan, the work of, you know, Shirley Sarman. I mean, just take any of our masters for a second. People did a lot of heavy lifting for us. So what's left for us? Well, we're, we're understanding more about the interface of lifestyle and environment on the human being. I think that's, that's newish because we can suddenly see larger data sets. And so if, if we're, the idea is sort of pattern induction through large data set and experience, well, suddenly our data sets are through the roof. I mean, if you were a lone physio or a lone chiro, working in a clinic, you were exposed to, let's just say, the, our, the physio model we work with is you get a patient an hour, right? In that hour, you can do whatever you need to do, have education about pain and lifestyle, and, and you can talk about movement quality, you can do exercise. Sometimes there's manual therapy involved to restore positions so that we can go move, right? So whatever that looks like, right? So if you work a busy day, you're seeing eight to 10 patients, eight to 10 hour day, and look at how long it takes you to see a thousand people. Right. Yeah. And and suddenly, if you're a coach and there are 20 to 30 people in your gym, well, all of those people are bringing in their, we'll, we'll just say, subclinical problems. Right. Yeah. And the, I think and we'll not even call it a subclinical problem, just lack of range of motion, poor diet. You know, and, and in real time, we have this diagnostic tool that is, it makes it easier for us to understand What's going on? Oh, you're hungover. You're super stressed. Oh, your performance sucked. You don't have any ankle range of motion, right? You're you're unskilled. Your power clean suck. Your swing suck. <laughs> and what really suddenly is interesting is that we can start to see instead of just waiting for this machinery to break, and more importantly, waiting for people to be, be in really dire situations, we have an we have an opportunity to address on the same spectrum, the yeah. same conversation, but much, much earlier in the process. And it's not our fault, but we made the medical community really appreciate that we were not taking pain seriously and made pain a vital sign. Pain is not a vital sign. That's like numbness and tingling is a vital sign or weakness is a vital sign, right? Um, you know, body composition may be a vital sign, right? But ultimately pain is not a vital sign. It's a highly subjective experience and if we just only value, we I still don't know stand. what pain is, right? Sorry for right. interrupting, but we still That's don't. Right. Know. Well, I, and people are going to self-soothe with pain anyway, right? So we're not sure. We know that it's information, but if I told you, like, you just tested weak, or you know, your balance is off because the session cost is so high from yesterday, you know, that for me is just the same and on the same level as pain. In fact, 
if you poured it in to some of my athletes, like in the middle of their world championship runs, right, and you dropped into their body, you would implode in pain. You would not be able to handle the level of subjective suffering that they're managing as part of their day to day. Yeah. And if you, I think if you dropped into people like my grandfather who had chronic low back pain, still was, you know, was of that World War II generation, you know, went to Vietnam, wow. you know, was in Korea, like pain was like, yeah, pain is my companion. What are we talking about again? Yeah. You know, hand me that whiskey. And yeah. so, <laughs> right. So uh, we're, again, Pain is a part of the human experience, but if that is our medical intervention and our only model by saying we're getting better or not better, then that skews the entire conversation into who gets paid for pain, whose pain, whose responsibility is pain. And if you're only allowed to see or you only trigger your medical sort of musculoskeletal care health, see a physician when you have pain, well, that's not actually true. You only see the person when you can no longer occupy your role in society, do your role on the team, do your mm -hmm. sport. Now your pain is so much that it's ruined or changed your role. So now think about how much that person has dealt with, right? Look, if we thought pain was the thing, if someone had pain after, after a jog, right? Their knees a little sore, right? This did some big volume or a big race or ran and had an adaptation problem. And all of a sudden they're like, knee hurts. Oh, I better go see my doctor. Like that never happened in the history of the world. Right? We that, that's, well, yeah, well, maybe, but, and also, you know, what, the, what would be the advice? You know, uh, rest, don't run. Like, come on, that's what they're doing anyway. So, you know, the, the question is, where do we start to synthesize and integrate these really seemingly disparate fields into a cogent whole. That is the task of this generation of providers. So who's Kelly Starrett? Oh, that's a good question. Family man, uh, tinkerer, obsessive, good husband. Look, I, you know, what's interesting is I am so fortunate that I found this job. The no way, way I, well, the way I get to work and interact and think about human environment interaction. That's really what it is. It's what I studied in college. I was a geography major, but a cultural geography major. You know, there's a great book by Jared Diamond called Guns, Germs, and Steel, which is really looking at human inter environment interaction and how that shapes our sociobiology. If you look, read, you know, E.O. Wilson, you know, and as the preeminent sociobiologist of really trying to understand behavior, evolutionary biological behavior, and how that shapes our consciousness, tribe, sense of identity, layer in Daniel Lieberman, who is my, yeah. like my favorite story. Yeah. And if you've never read story of the human body, it's so yeah. great. Yeah. Very but very all cool. of a sudden you really try to understand, you know, the way my brain works is I really try to understand the big picture. And I try to, under, I'm really, if I only, if I have any talents at all, it's for pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. And I have been obsessed with trying to understand how to go faster and understand my body and sport for as long as I can remember. My mother's a psychologist, my father's a physician, my grandfather's a physician. And I, what's really interesting is I don't think this field really existed until I happened in at the right time, at the right place. Discovered CrossFit, you know, early on in 2004 was when I started CrossFitting. And at that time, take the games out of it. What we saw is that people were not very fit. You know, yeah. we saw is that, you know, we weren't very skilled and we certainly weren't very strong. And I wasn't capable of kettlebells, dumbbells, Olympic lifting, gymnastics, didn't know how to run, didn't know how to sprint, wasn't a very good jumper, right? Didn't think about energy systems. And so suddenly I had this crash course and, and, and I was already on the national team. I was already an elite national champion athlete, but I, you know, I had succeeded without any formalized training. You know, we, the zone, I mean, people, people's nutrition was standard American diet. You know, like we just didn't get it. You know, we, we understood what we had. And then, so now all of a sudden I get to take the, you know, when I, when I talk to people like Stuart McMillan, a mutual friend of ours, Stu is a good friend. He's also a pretty great coach, right? I don't like, where is my professional boundary? Where's my personal boundary? Where's my hobby boundary? They're, they're all integrated. Yeah. And so my friends are coaches. This is what I talk about. My wife is a three-time world champion whitewater paddler. She was a rower at Cal. You know, we're up at 6 a.m. this morning training for a brutal bike hill climb. And, and what I'm saying is 
where's the edge? And so what's really amazing is that I had no idea that I would find a tribe and community of people, Laird and Gabby, Laird Hamilton, Gabby Reese, Sir McMillan, these diverse fields of performance and thinking about longevity and lifestyle. And this is, this is it. You know, I happen to be trained as a physio, but we're really realizing that, man, I can either wait until the tractor trailer is on fire, put out the fire, then talk about turning the tractor around in the blind alley and then <laughs> driving it. Or it seems to me we can be having much more significant, greater impact conversations earlier in the process, which may mean how do we think about developing the human body for a longevity, a lifetime of play, a lifetime of capacity from middle school? How do we think about, you know, pushing schools to start later? How do we think about getting enough non-exercise activity? So what's really interesting is that, you know, I think pre-shutdown, we were shut in, um, shelter in place. It's not a shutdown at all. Um, it's, it's devastating, comma. Um, we were sort of at peak bullshit fitness, peak wellness bullshit. And um, the amount of noise in social media, the amount of noise, you know, my hard style versus your soft style, the number of you know battling between diet paradigms, you know, vegan versus current like oh god madness. Yeah. And if I'm really being honest, if the per EO Wilson, the highest goal of science is to improve the humanities, okay. So we're all movement professionals, we're all health experts. Let's give ourselves a grade. How are we doing? Because we have an opportunity right now to really try to understand what our work has meant to society at large. Kids are tearing their ACLs at freakishly high rates. Women are tearing their ACLs at six to eight times the rate of men. When you and I went to high school, chances of us being diabetic, one in 4,000. Now for kids, it's one in four. If you're an African-American woman or a Latino male, it's two out of three. Chance of you being obese in America is like 80%. 17% of America, or excuse me, 12% of Americans right now are free of being overweight, being hypertensive, not diabetic. So all of a sudden, I have to say, is musculoskeletal pain less of a problem or more a problem? Are we seeing more reported low back pain or, or, you know, like the number one reason people see a physician now is musculoskeletal health, right? Yeah. So let me just give us a grade. We're doing shit. We've done a shit job. We haven't helped the most vulnerable amongst us. In the United States, the research is that by either 2030 or maybe 2035, we may be bankrupt from the cost of being so diabetic as a nation. So again, you can argue about pain mechanisms. I think that's a really cute argument, right? But until, until you actually go and drive societal change, we don't get to be part of the table. And we're gonna have to think about this differently as we're watching COVID rip through communities with poor health access, poor nutritional access, food insecurity, high stress, Right. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, it turns out that if we have super morbidly obese kids now, which we are seeing, this is about national security. This is about social justice. And so as we as we become chiros and physios and doctors and osteopaths, I think we're going to have to ask ourselves, how was it working? Because right now we may be able to reimagine our fields with with great. That's a great point, because with great knowledge comes great responsibility. And the mentality out there is, oh, you've got a flat tire, let's put more air in, rather than saying, let's change the tire. And we're living in a planet of publishers. Everybody has a blog, a video, posting things. But are people so easy to actually see the litter of the bullshit? Or is it us? Because I love your work. I've been following you for ages. We've talked in the past uh, through emails, but you're keeping legit work out there and you're trying to create a change. And that was a really good segue for what you did is Kelly before CrossFit. Because, you know, a lot of people are saying Kelly Starrett CrossFit. I'm like, no, Kelly Starrett. Well, you know, I'm not embarrassed by being associated with CrossFit. I might have to close my gym. But what I saw for the first time in this group training model was in a really respectable amount of time, we could do some metabolic conditioning. Yeah. In a really respectable amount of time, we could we could improve skill and coordination. You know, France Bosch is one of my heroes. I've never met him, but his thinking and writing around, is this just strength training or is this coordination training? Is this, is this fascial loading? Is this 
you know, let's, let's look, you know, what are the aspects of going to the gym that have nothing to do with training and everything to do with being in a community in the tribe, right? Where you're getting a positive regard for the day. You took your joints through a full range of motion during the dynamic warm up. Because what we're, what we're arguing about is how many kettlebell swings you need to do. And I think that, once again, is a specious, ridiculous argument. You know, what, what's been amazing is that a good business model and one that I have that really made sense to me was to help people solve their problems. You know, we never set out to do any of this. We set out, I owned a gym, opened the gym when I was a physio student and set out to solve the problems of my gym. Because what I saw was that I was like, okay, we're doing pull-ups or we're going to muscle snatch or we're going to strict press. And I noticed that people couldn't put their arms over their head. They couldn't do handstands. And they're like, why am I sucking handstands? I'm like, I don't know. You can't put your arms over your head. Maybe that has something to do with it, right? And it turned out that just more drills, more skill exercises didn't get me what I needed in those three to five hours of contact time a week, right? And so what we realize is that the training experience is as much about positional remediation and improvement as it is about improving the physiology, right? If you have a really crappy bent frame and the wheels are out of true and you have a weak transmission, you're like, let's get a bigger engine on this thing. <laughs> and I think that's a normal expression of where we came from out of sports science was really sports science is really sports measurement. Let's, let's be honest and yeah. not throwing any shade because it's really difficult to understand the most complex structure in the human universe, which is the human 100%. body. So, you know, what, what I appreciate is that it was easy to measure another kilo on the bar. It was easier to measure if you went faster and generate more Watts. Right. And then we were like, well, we think this is what's happening. Meanwhile, did that make you a better athlete? Did that make you, did that improve your balance? Did that, you know, show, you know, did that change your body composition? Like, you know, I, I think the, the question is, what are we training for? What's the minimum therapeutic dose of the gym? And I, what's interesting is that the gym culture hit a peak with CrossFit games, with programmers like Ido Portal, um, brilliant people who are like, yes, you're going to need to spend two hours in the gym every day. And, and if you can't do that, I don't know what to tell you, you know, and I'm like, well, okay, I've got two, two daughters, two businesses. I don't have two hours a day to do 16 CrossFit workouts or Ido Portal's amazing, brilliant programming. It's brilliant, comma, not for me. You know, how do we wrap our heads around? And I'm, I don't, I didn't mean to choose him as to throw shade, no, but just 100%. my point is the gym became a recursive experience. And we did get glimpses like Bondarchuk, the Olympic track and field coach, you know, a long time ago is like, Hey, you know, you actually can bench enough. You need to throw more. Right? You know, he's a, he's a, he's a shopper coach, you're a hammer coach. And I think that let's appreciate that we, we got so enamored by developing physiology because it was easy to see that, man, my deadlift went up again, my squat went up again. And there were a generation of coaches who said, you know, the goal is, Hey, you're strong enough now. Like Pavel did a really good job of saying, Oh, you have a double body weight back squat. You're probably good enough to do whatever you want. I had a uh, a football coach over at Cal that I worked with for a long time, who said, oh, you can full snatch 100 kilos, you can play college football. Like, you're you're actually strong enough to full, you know, like, what are we talking about, right? So I, I think what that begets, though, is it begets, it creates a lot of uncertainty, like how much is enough versus strength is never a weakness. You can always be stronger, more explosive. You know, um, one of the greatest track and field coaches I know, Harry Mara, you know, the last year that he was working with um, his brilliant decathletes, um, you know, they did, they were strong enough. He always carried a medicine ball and was always working on springiness, was always working on intramuscular coordination and timing and rhythm. And what he was like is like, hey, I need my athletes to be more explosive. And what, what we saw out of the, the fitness craze is that we took our springiest, most dynamic athletic people and we made them look bad in the gym, right? The kid that you like could backflip off the trampoline, <laughs> skateboard goofy and catch a ball blind. That kid suddenly just didn't look very right because they he couldn't do as many reps of the kettlebell swing or his burpee. And what we did was we actually programmed in less explosiveness, less speed. And that's that's an artifact, an expression of us trying to understand what was essential. Right. So now we can calibrate up. Now we can calibrate down. And in that conversation is who owns pain? When are you going to address that, that muscular stiffness? When are you going to address that capsular restriction? When something hurts because you've just done a ton of muscle ups or you lost coordination or in your training, where do you get taken care of? Is your physio 
right next to the squat rack is your Cairo leading your class, because that is how we're going to project, right? Post-surgery, of course, go, go see your provider. That's, that's different. You have, you've had pathology. There are, you know, ankylosing spondylitis. There are plenty of things going on. But don't tell me spondylolisthesis, spondy of the spine, was just an artifact of a maladaptation to your spinal extension, which is just normal. Like, what a bunch of horse crap that is, right? Like, that is a, a poorly integrated, poor functioning spine. And now we have a spinal problem or an irritation. And that kid is 13 years old and in a brace. That happens to be my cousin, you know, one of my, my, my second cousins, you know, who was a national champion javelin thrower right? At a very young age, at 14, broke his back, throwing the javelin. So what are we talking about? You know what I mean? So I, I guess that's really where it's difficult for us to integrate nutrition, genetics. And once again, if, I, if I'm beating the same drum, synthesis is the game right now. A hundred percent, because there are so many aspects, as you said, uh, to bring together. And sometimes we're lost in translation because, as you said before, I was talking to Coach Mike Boyle a couple of weeks ago, and he said, if you start listening to people saying, oh, how much you bench and how much you squat, this person has a problem. <laughs> and, well, and, and, and the flip side of that is, what do you mean you can't bench your body weight, right? You, you can't do 10 push-ups, right? You, like, like you, you're arguing about squatting, but you can't squat yet, right? Versus, yeah. you know, oh, okay, you, you, can, you can back squat 315, back squat 200 as a woman, you're probably like, we're good to go, right? So, you know, he is absolutely right. And if we take Mike Boyle, he's a great test case as one of my senior mentor coaches who I so respect. And partly is he had 600 people going through his facility all the time, right? Lots of people. So I set up my gym to look and work like Mike Boyle's gym. I have racks down the middle. We could create pathways and move through. And what we have to appreciate is not that you have to adopt 100% of his techniques, but what problems was he trying to solve? Especially if, how are we going to get people moving? Where do we do the conditioning? You know, if someone is doing a ton of conditioning on the ice, do we need to do a bunch of conditioning in the gym? What's essential in the sport? What's essential when I'm not in the sport? Does that look different than developing people to prepare for sports? Now we're, it, you're going to have to become more sophisticated. That's okay. And that's what, what this is all about. Because actually, like Mike is, for me, is like first generation, right? proper strength coach oh yeah yeah for sure yeah and I, I what one thing he was saying is if i hear something or i like something i'm gonna go see it and learn from that guy and i was like wow like very very true and you know that some of the inner so um one of our friends is a guy named stephen cutler who wrote a book called rise of the superman which i highly recommend and it's really about how extreme athletes right boaters climbers skiers basically through extreme sports, and again, whatever, outdoor sports, basically trick flow state and what we can learn about flow state, right? How do we, you know, how does an elite athlete or elite performance or elite violinist, how do they get into flow? How do we hack that process, right? That transient, uh, what do they call it? Transient cortical hypofrontality, right? I think that's the, the te technical term. And, you know, what I appreciate about, you know, it, I'll come back. I don't, I'm, I'm going down, I'm, I'm getting sidetracked, but the bottom line is what we appreciate is that in what Steven is saying is that we saw a jump all of a sudden when the VHS came, when people yeah. started to record and learn. And so, you know, you could quickly upskill, up, uptake new information. And what we saw was that a, there was a quantum leap in performance, right? Mm -hmm. As soon as someone broke the four minute mile, poof, there was a lot of people breaking the four minute mile. Like, oh, it's possible. That's how we did it, right? Just there's something magical about that. And what, what we saw then is that it's easy to be a young coach and to have access to all of this tape and become an expert coach with zero coaching experience an expert coach with zero context experience, an expert coach without ever having gone to Mike Boyle's gym, an expert coach without ever having shut up and watched a senior Olympic lifting coach. You know, I, I, would, I was a student, I had a baby, I would fly down, sleep on coach Mike Bergner's couch, a uh, friend's couch, and I would coach for 
Coach Bergner for two or three days in a row, unpaid. And I was so thrilled to help him coach, move barbells, help run assistant drills, shut the hell up, right? Just be an asset in the room. And I would be like, thank you. I hope I can come back. And you'd be like, please come back. And I'd be like, yes. And I would fly down again when I could save up enough money. And, you know, there's less of that these days of people showing up and being prepared to participate, being prepared to witness. We want the expert level experience without ever being ready to be really Padawan learners. And what I'll tell you is um, one of our good friends, Rachel Balkebeck, a mutual friend of Stu McMillan and I, she was the first woman strength and conditioning coach in baseball. And now is the first woman hitting coach in baseball. So she has broken two. She's the Amelia Earhart times two. And she says, man, you know, I don't understand anything. And yes, today I'm a better coach than I was yesterday. And yesterday I apologize. Like it's an open process. You never win being an expert coach. You're always looking, always seeking, always making better hypotheses, right? Eventually, if you drop in and Mike Boyle coaches you in person, I guarantee you, you're going to get to the point very quickly. You're going to, there's not going to be a lot of wasted bullshit, right? You will get to the, he knows what you need, can read and identify, understand the patterns. But for the, for those of us who are starting out, be prepared to go in and see and watch everything. Jump into yoga. Jump into Pilates. What problems were they trying to solve? You know, go watch track and field. Just shut up and watch. How do they run warm-ups? What skills are they trying to do? What what does the regen look like? Why are they doing that? Why does you know why does Mike Verst- Mark Verstegen do what he does? You know why does why, you know why do the British health physios think the way they think? You know what is going on? And suddenly everything is available to you to synthesize and integrate. And if it takes you a minute and you struggle, then you're on the right path. A hundred percent with you. How can we develop better coaches, not exercise providers? Oh yeah. You know, you're going to see it right now. This is a really interesting time. Um, you know, we're, we're still coaching a lot on zoom, right? Trying to do our best and you cannot turn on, like, here's the workout. We're going to power clean today, work up to a heavy single, turn on the music, walk away, kind of give some coaching, check your phone, drink your coffee, right? That day is gone. And, you know, now on Zoom, people are like coaching the whole time to fill the whole time. We call those workout administrators, right? And what is interesting, I think, is one, we're going to have a better professional field, an even more professional field. There are certainly professionals in our field. And I'm not talking about necessarily formal, you know, accreditation. I mean, that's, you know, that's bureaucracy, but you're going to see that there are professional coaches and they're not professional coaches. So if you want to go lead a dance flow Zumba free fest, that's cool, but that is not professional coaching. And it's crucial and vital. We, we use dance as warm up. We use dances to explore positions and shapes. We use dance to be in, in wretched shapes. Right. And, um, unloaded fun we feel great with that comma you know what we're going to have to see is that we're going to have to provide health insurance we're going to have to make it a a living wage if you look at some of the best coaches in the world making working their asses off 60 70 80 hours a week making fifty thousand dollars forty thousand dollars thirty thousand pounds working as a strength coach for a professional team in the uk it's crazy so let's prove our worth right now and let's think about, you know, what, what it is we need to make change so that when you say, um, someone says, sits down to you and they're like, I'm a teacher. You're like, cool. That's cool. I'm a doctor. Wow. And you're like, I'm a coach. People are like, Oh shit. That's, that's the shit, right? That's where we need to go. A great chiropractor once said that if he's also a coach, um, he, he's up in Canada. He's one of my mentors said, if I go into a room and people think I'm a chiropractor, I'm about I'm a back coach. Oh, interesting. Because you're saying that you need to bring in a lot of things and not being biased because of your profession, right? As yeah, you oh, said. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And you're yeah. coming in, you know, you've got a physical background. You were an athlete. You've got an amazing woman, Juliet. I talk, talked a lot of times because I want to have her on board because she's wow. And you bring in so many things from so many angles. You cannot say you're a physio. You know what I mean? Or if people go in and they're like, oh, you're a physio. It's like they're missing the point. And we're, you know, holding so many. Uh, it's like a Formula One driver with all the certifications. But at the end of the day, what did you actually know? Because that was the big boom with CrossFit, right? You did a weekend and you were a coach. Yeah. And that was, um, right, the barrier to entry was low. 
and what we saw was, man, there's was, there's was still a lot of safety built into this, oh, and it was gonna and it was gonna take a minute because I tell you, um, I think some of the best coaching in the world is going on in CrossFit gyms right now, right? Mm -hmm. And some of the experience amongst our elite CrossFit coaches, you know, for the the athletes, very sophisticated. Right there in London, there's a coach named Yami Tikkanen who, and his company is called The Training Plan, who's one of the most sophisticated, thoughtful engineers, brilliant coaches I've ever seen in the world. He's one of the most hidden Yami Tikkanen right there, right? And, um, and simultaneously, that's a very valid point. Like, you know, you know, oh, really? You think in, in a weekend you can understand enough to be able to manage complexity in the gym? And what we saw, though, is, you know, we easy barrier to entry, right, where you could get some light industrial space for, you know, a thousand quid. You know, you could buy some barbells. You're like, let's do this, right? And learning on the job is a lot of what we all did. What I will tell you, though, in defense is that now our beginner coaches are much better than the, the experts that I used, used to know 15 years ago. Oh, so to come through, to coach at my gym, for example, we have a 160-hour internship process, plus you the certifications you have to go to are courses of experts we love. Like you need to go to this Olympic lifting course. You need to take my online mobility course. Right? You, we, we, we make sure that people are diverse. Then they shadow and so coach alongside as assistants for 160 hours. And so they begin to see through volume and repetition. There is no substitution for repetition, you know, no. and it takes a minute. So they find a voice, they find a style, they can in and out, they can see problems, you know, they can develop a, a basic set of pattern recognition. Then you begin to understand, you know, I, every time I train or move or do something, it's like sometimes I'm like, wow, I don't think I've ever understood that till this moment. To this moment, my wife's like, ah, oh, that's deadlifting. You've been deadlifting since high school. You know, I'm like, yeah, but I didn't get it until now. You know, and she's like, you're ridiculous. <laughs> but, you know, the, the key is that this process of skill and mastery doesn't end. And I think what we thought was you've arrived and now, you know, you hit the top. Well, you know, you've hit the top because you have incredible relationships with other coaches. You have incredible, yeah. meaningful work with your clients. You can retire someday. You're building a retirement, you have health insurance, you can feed yourself, you're not working at an unsustainable rates that are going to cause horrific burnout. If we look at the chiropractic community, if we look at the physio community alone, student loans are unmanageable, force us into a system, having to see so many patients because it's the only job I can get that begets more burnout. And then they, the, the, the owner of the facility is trying to pay off their student loans, took a bunch of risk, and knows that there's another kid coming through the pipeline who's willing to put in, see 20 or 30 patients a day, not do the care, try to manage all the billing. The system is crazy. So how are we going to, again, reimagine what it means like? So if you book an, a session with a chiro physio, this is what it costs, and you get so much value of it, that people are willing to go. I mean, right now, if I ask people, I'm like, well, who's your physical therapist? They're like, I just go to Kaiser and, and I get one. I'm like, so someone just cuts your hair? Like you just show up and like, you're like, cut my hair. I don't know. You cut my hair. Like people are way more predict, you know, particular about their dentist and their hair cutter. You know, they will, they are more fascist about their coffee than they are particular about their provider. And that, that isn't good for the providers. That's not good for anyone. So, you know, right now we're seeing chiros and physios really struggle in the field, like in physical therapy, you know, big insurance isn't reimbursing for e-health visits. They're calling it an e-health visit. Yeah, and yeah. I'm like, dude, we, we've been seeing and helping manage people over the phone and over Skype and over video for 10 years. We have a language already built in that's, that's common. It's called human movement, right? So if I can ask you, if it's a musculoskeletal problem, right, we can manage load. We can talk about pain. We can talk about your environment. But we can also say, that's a shit position to squat in. I wonder if that has something to do with this, right? You, it's it's one, one more thing you can't tolerate in that triple, quadruple crush system. So right now, if, if we can't even get reimbursed as an essential aspect of, fit, uh, of wellness and health, are we going to well, see this field disappear? What about our young students? How, how do we serve them? And, and here's what I want to appreciate. Unless you're, if you're feeling the same way I do, what are you doing about it? Are you helping schools? 
Are you speaking at conventions? Are you mentoring students? Are like show show me if you don't like the system currently, you've Why got you you've yeah. got you've got to start somewhere about shifting the system. And you've done that. Well, that's not my intention. My intention is to solve a set of problems. The problems I was trying to solve were at my gym, right? And then, you know, realizing that there was a lot of things that I believed in my experience and expertise to be unskilled. Quad stiffness or missing hip extension. You bridge that. And I remember uh, the um, uh, supple uh, lip part. Uh, lip part, which actually I want to tell you, um, I got both books. Yeah, I've got the old one and the new version. You're, you're different in the movement. I don't know if you can understand what I'm saying. Like the pictures... Yeah, they're two different Kellys. Oh yeah. Why is it okay? Like you know what I mean? Like so more because we see it from a uh, more biomechanically and more postural. On the second one, it's a different Kelly. More more mobility. Yes. Is that like you know what I mean? The other I one was. I, I practice what I preach. I was a professional kayak. You see thoracic kyphosis there, right? Exactly. I'm stiff in that position, and all of a sudden you start to see the system change. We're working on the third edition of the book. The the second edition just had its fifth anniversary, and oh, we man. just we just went over five hundred thousand copies of that book in circulation, which is which is mind. But the next edition, really, we we appreciate that we can integrate even more because everyone's ready for the conversation. We can talk about desensitization techniques. What's the role of percussion therapy? How do we think about blood flow restriction inclusion? You know, why can't everyone scrape? You know, gua sha is not a technique that that Thank you, you need a, a license for. That's that's something that you do at home to make yourself feel better if something hurts, right? You have an osteofascial bump or an osteotendon, you know, bump. Something's ugly there. That's your opportunity to, to improve that. And I don't need to go. So we're shifting. We've got understanding much better movement assessments that we'll put out, help people to get to the point faster so they can get off it and back to the thing they love, right? What's the minimum therapeutic dose? We just, you know, we're one of the things that we, you know, we haven't backed out of anything we said in Supple Leopard. We've refined how we teach squatting. Why? Because I got another 10 years of experience teaching people to squat and I'm more effective at it and get more bang for the buck more quickly. Right. So helping people, you know, level up and I'm a user. I, you know, this is a living document because 100%. I've, I've coached. We've all become more sophisticated. When we started this thing, honestly, I started teaching a course in 2008. That's when I started teaching this movement and mobility course. And we, I would say to people, I'm like, okay, you're, you're pretty good, but this is your leg. And people were like, this is amazing information. I was like, let me introduce you to your leg. And they were like, wow, I PR'd on my deadlift 100 pounds because I know this is what my leg does. I mean, the bar was so low, right? People, people did not anything except intensity, 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 carbs. Right. I mean, that, that was really the conversation at the time, right? Need to eat more carbs, need more, yeah. you know, pre-fuel. Now what we're seeing is that, wow, you know, the world has become very sophisticated and we have a real opportunity to expand the role of the coach and trainer into owning and being the first line of defense for pain and musculoskeletal dysfunction mm -hmm. and to act as screens for when someone has red flags, you know, if you don't want everyone, every trainer you know to be able to identify numbness, tingling, night sweats, diseases, fever, vomiting, nausea, on account for weight loss, weight gain, you are part of the problem. I want them to be like, oh, you know what? This is not something is sketchy going on here. Or, hey, there's a bone sticking out of your leg. Let's call our favorite physio friend or favorite doctor friend, right? So what we think is we have a real real opportunity to raise the bar and, and unload what we thought was non-skilled care. Because if you came to me for a neurologic hamstring tightness problem and someone could have taught you to organize and sequence a little differently and solve that problem without having to go see a physician, get a referral, what are we doing? We're just wasting everyone's time and energy into a system. And look, physios can wear both those hats, but that means that the physio, chiro, osteo, napropath world is going to also have to be able to teach deadlifting and say things not to my athletes like be the, be the voice of no, like just don't put more than 85 pounds over your head. What the wow. hell? Stop running. What? I'm a human being. What do you mean stop running? Right? Like, so. Sit I, home with donuts. 
Oh, right. Or, or don't come to the clinic and expect me to push on your back. That is not what we do here, right? Pushing on your back may be something to get something moving so that we can teach you to move and get you independent. But don't come in here looking for, you know, a quick, a quick fix. Like physio is not a pill that you take. Osseo, Cairo is not a pill you take. It's an integrated systems-based approach to get you functional back to your life. And so we're going to have to make the Cairo physio, more like a coach, better at teaching movement, better understanding movement paradigms. I mean, if you, I mean, if you're a, if you're a provider and you can't jump into a yoga class and understand what the hell's going on, like you suck. You know, if you if you can't do Pilates, if you can't swing a kettlebell, if you can't do basic barbell movements, if you don't know how to watch someone run and watch what's going on and say, and if you say things like heel striking, it's okay. It's not okay. Like, what are we doing? So. We have this incredible opportunity, and there's going to be some overlap there. We're okay with it. hundred percent. And as you said about the heel striking, board to run was also uh, – Oh. Because awesome. I've been talking about barefoot, barefoot for so many years, and uh, also about the helix, the big toe, about how important it is. And people were looking at you and was like, what the hell? I was like, dude, just – even on a deadlift, just put that claw down. And they're like, oh, I feel more stable. I'm like – yeah, can you imagine that you've got muscles underneath there and 200,000 proprioceptors that need to start working? So take that grave out of your foot and start feeling what happens there. And I think that book came out so I could validate that because that was a great book too. Yeah, you know, and I, th I think that's really what's interesting. You know, if I'm like, hey, are you afraid to go run barefoot? You know, people are like, whoa, dangerous. I'm like, whoa, whoa. You know, what's interesting, what I want us to do if we're clever enough and we're not in existential threat drive because this is an existential threat. It is. I don't feel safe. I can't provide for my family. I have food insecure. You and I are having a very great conversation that we're very privileged to have. Okay. So with that caveat, there's an incredible opportunity here to understand and, and see and witness behavior change. And that really is the ultimate thing that we're talking about. Movement is a behavior, cognition, behavior, right? So what we're really trying to do when, we, when we're trying to change or improve or, or make more robust uh, movement behaviors, we're really ultimately trying to change a behavior, right? Neurons that fire together, wire together. Neurons that fire apart, wire apart. I mean, this is, this is motor learning, skill learning, cognition one -on -one. learning. 101. But all of a sudden, we see that people are barefoot more now than they've ever been in their whole life. We have a woman in our neighborhood who has a terrible pelvic floor dysfunction. She's seen our expert pelvic floor therapist, and we're like, look, you wear high heel shoes all the time, like really extreme. She's like, I don't like being low. And it doesn't feel good when my heels are on the ground now, right? So that drives her into a huge overextended pelvis, right? So she's got it, she's cranking her pelvis, that pelvis, and I don't want to say anterior pelvic tilt, but that's what it is. And that inhibits her pelvic floor. Because she's positionally inhibited, she has no relationship with her pelvic floor. She doesn't have a movement practice. She doesn't like to lift weights. She doesn't like to train. She doesn't do Pilates, right? And she, it's really become a problem. But suddenly, I saw her, and she's like, hey, my feet are sore all the time. And I'm like, what's going on? She's like, well, I'm, I'm barefoot so much. And I'm like, oh, well, you might actually solve that pelvic floor problem for once, right? And, you know, I just want to appreciate that there's going to be a lot of things like this where we can see suddenly where people were getting enough the minimum non-exercise activity because you lived in a city you walked right and suddenly you're not able to walk and what happens what what do you do then so the the thin veneer of enough exercise enough loading enough non-exercise activity thermogenesis that's gone and you know we're gonna then let's you know we again there's the number of olympians i've seen who've gone through depression because they've canceled the Olympics or elite athletes have had their, their sport and, you know, Crimea river, you're an elite athlete. It's real. It's a small death. And it's the same as our high school kids who didn't get to go through graduation. It's our same, like, so, you know, what we're seeing is that there's, we're going to have to be clever enough to spot the opportunities. As I said earlier, we either win or we learn. And right now, no one, no one is winning. So we better be paying attention. And we have a real opportunity. And those of us who are providers, um, those of us who are coaches who really talk about human performance, and, and not just in a global way, but human function, human being function, you know, we really can start to see this biopsychosocial model played out. And, well, people aren't part of the tribe right now. People don't feel safe right now. You know, one of our neighbors 
we have a, sometimes a little happy hour on Friday where people come in our street and just, you know, they see each other. They really are trying to be respectful. They're wearing masks. And he's like, dude, my back got all tweaky again. I didn't do anything. And I was like, it has nothing to do with what you're moving. You're under a freakish amount of stress, Steve. You know, and he's like, oh, yeah, I didn't thought about that. And I was like, there you go. And also, you're stiff as fuck. So why don't you do bo something about both those things? Like, what's your plan to be less stiff, right? Improve the mechanics and efficiency of the system. And how are you managing your stress? We got to have all these conversations and be prepared because no one, I think, is better at being able to have this conversation about food quality, movement, right? Being agnostic about how you want to do it. What are the minimum doses? How do we take care for ourselves? The number of patients we have who are facing chronic pain and persistent pain little cortical smudging who are in really dire straits can't see their physician can't see their physiatrist can't see their chiro can't get injections can't get radio frequency, radio frequency ablation can't get their prescription filled what is the plan for them right we've got to do a job of, of being that water that can just solve the problem in whatever field and i think some form of formal therapeutic training and coaching together is maybe how we're going to solve the problem of human condition. It's all about um, empathy, because um, a lot of people uh, texted me, it's like, oh, you're not posting any videos, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. I'm like, I try to talk with my athletes or my clients because it's a really stressful period. And I always say, you know, sometimes too much exercise can overfill their stress. Yes, yes. And so I'm like, let's take some out. Let's talk how they are, how are they feeling? Because, you know, people are 24 seven with their kid. 24 seven with their wife, it's it's sometimes a danger zone. So what I would say is, I said to one of my clients the other day, I was like, can you take care of the kids for half an hour, let her go for a walk, and then when she comes back, do the same. He called me up two days later and he's like, you saved our life? And I was like, you didn't even think about it? He's like, no, because no. we take everything for granted. Like, oh, did you do your workout today? Did you do this? And I was like, I don't care. Are you okay? That's my well, question. And this is one of the things that I, I, re I really appreciate that approach is that so, for example, through our website, The Ready State, right, where we try to empower people to self-soothe, self-care, self-diagnose, right? It's all about someone. I, but we have so many coaches, and I, honestly, I built this thing for coaches so that it could be a resource for coaches and therapists to be, able to, to be able to not have to do one more thing, but they can be like, watch this video or do this or watch this position, right? You know, I've handled the programming for you. But I trust you that you know your community better than I could ever I don't know what time you get up. I don't, you know, why don't you work with your coach on figuring out how this plan is going to work in your life? So we end up being really agnostic about training modalities. Like if you ask me, I'm a coach. I have strong feelings about the way I think you should prepare to get ready to be a elite level Tour de France cyclist, right? But I'm going to trust you and your coach that your, you and your coach really understand how to prepare and what I can come in and say, hey, I see that this is an incomplete position or let's take care of this tissue or here's a, a better better management style. I'll, I'll trust that you can work it into the thing that you know best. And that's why it's so powerful, these relationships, because you, this guy didn't appreciate, he's just managing, right? He's not an expert in this biopsychosocial, you know, mental thing. And you can see the problem quickly. So I don't have to go out. We can talk general generalities and principles, but the nuance of being able to go serve your community, that's the power of this decentralized system. Exactly. And uh, that's what we're trying to do. Cause that's the difference between what we said before, coaching and being, uh, as you said, uh, exercise administrator. Because that's, yes. yeah. <laughs> what we don't need is more burpees right now in the world. Uh, I mean, good uh, luck. There's, there is plenty of at-home bodyweight exercises on the on the instagram you know even i'm oh. bored of watching people do air squats and lift lift their couch there is going to be a reckoning we are anti-fragile we are robust we can be indoors and not move around very very much for, but it, we won't be able to do it forever we're going to have to start walking again we're going to have to start rebuilding our our physiology some people aren't able to go outside some people aren't getting any sunlight on their bodies right now some people don't uh, you know are under real stress and i'll tell you you think that the the epidemic is gnarly now couple thoughts one we have not gotten to summer where there's no school yet so if you have a kid you're screwed right you have no summer camp <laughs> and you have to work i'm telling my my oldest daughter 15 i'm like you can have a killer business if you just run an online summer camp education for 30 minutes or an hour parents can be like can you just babysit my kid for an hour but i'm like that is business right but also 
you know, this is a function of globalization. Oh, not not globalization. That's globalization is the is the modern interconnected world we live in. Globalism is, you know, race to the bottom, commodity, you know, consumerism, right? And and a virus spreading the world is 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 globalism. But this is going to happen again. Right. Either with this virus or another virus, because we're just too interconnected as we should be. This is how we have better society. Yeah. But it's, but also wait until climate change starts to rear its head and we displace. People forget that the Syrian humanitarian crisis was a, was a climate change problem initially. Yeah. Right. The farmers dried up. They moved to the cities, started the thing rolling. Wait until the middle of America, you know, in Texas is 100 or Phoenix is 125, 130 degrees in the summer or Miami floods. And we yeah. see mass migration displacement. For a moment, we're, what I think is we need to say, well, what do human beings, what should we be responsible for? We should be responsible for knowing how to cook. We should be responsible for knowing how to shop. We should be responsible for you know, setting up better food systems and movement systems. And, and we should be able to be independent of exercise on home. You know, what does that look like? You know, and, and then where do, we have, where do we initiate that conversation? What, is, what, what does school physical education need to look like now? So I think, again, it's complicated, but it it's is. not so complicated and sophisticated that we can't work it out. So let's start somewhere. But we become a bit, uh, became a bit delicate snowflakes because I always say go back to the roots because I, I sometimes say to young kids, it's like, what would you do if I take the, the Wi-Fi out of you? What would you do? What would I you do if you didn't have any power? Which I'm not, I'm just, I don't want to create that, you know, negativity, but I'm just want to say, is there more things out there? Feel more I productive? Yeah, I, w- I wonder if our kids are going to get their fill of this. They're going to see, like, we definitely have seen really addiction, addictive behaviors develop from tech, from parents I'm talking to. It's because it's a matter of survival, you know, and, and I'll flip this on the other, on its head. Man, if I was a teacher, I would be super bummed right now. This is not why I signed up to teach, right? Yeah. And and so everyone everyone is hurting. But I think you really do make this compelling case about evening walks. And I mean, our neighborhood, you know, people are saying hi. Our next door neighbor, he and I got into a battle over some fencing a few years ago. And he was just, you know, a curmudgeon about it. That's a nice word. Yeah. And uh, we decided right then that we would never like each other ever again. In fact, I just built my fence inside the old fence. And I was like, you can enjoy the old fence, jerk. Yeah. I'll take, I'll just eat into my own property line because fuck you. And um, now he stopped me and said, how's your business? So we have an opportunity to rebuild bridges. We have, you know, we have an opportunity to serve each other. And I think the gym environment for me is the microcosm. It's the third place. It's the, it's the modern church. It's the, it's the modern you know, farmers co-op. And so what we see suddenly is a group of people who can care for themselves. And that's the heart of communitarianism. This is creating a microgrid in your neighborhood where everyone generates power and all the power goes back to the microgrid, right? This, this helps us to be independent. This helps us to develop systems and school and resources for each other. And again, I understand it's complexity and it's difficult to scale, but we don't have to do that. You just need to improve your neighborhood. You know, sir, if you're a coach or provider, serve sure. the people that you take care of. Because right next to you, there's another provider who's doing the same. A hundred percent. No, no, it's, it's exactly what you said. You talk a lot about mobility and I've got one thing I, when I coach or when I assess someone, because we forgot about assessments, right? Like, oh, you've got pain. Okay, let's do this. We've got stiffness and say, okay, work it out. Try to stretch. And I'm like, well, it's a compensating mechanism. Don't we need to back off a bit and see what's. Mm-mm-mm-mm. So this is a, this is a very popular thing to say. Stiffness is a compensation mechanism and highly detrained individuals. That may be true. When you exercise and squat and bike, what's, what's the mechanism for adaptation? First thing that happens is you don't build other bigger muscles as nope. you undergo delayed onset muscle soreness. You lay down collagen and yep. the structure of the system becomes more robust. First, you build a bigger house, then you move more furniture into the house. Yeah. That's the system. So sometimes we see plain old stiffness as a problem. Why? Because you don't have a movement practice. You don't have an issue, right? You just have trained, 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 and never dealt with that stiffness. You don't do sun salutation. You don't have a movement flow, right? Hip flow warm up. And so, yes, sometimes stiffness, I'll put in quotation marks, is a motor response to having poor motor control. But in athletic populations, sometimes 
stiffness is the focus. So again, the first thing I want to see is let me see you move. Then if you lay down on your stomach and I have you go passive and I check your passive range of motion and you get stuck at 90 degrees and you can't bend your leg past 90 degrees when you're on your stomach, that has nothing to do with your brain protecting your body. You're just and, good old fashioned stiffness. And right? that was so my point. Knowing the difference is the key. Exactly. Because that all starts from assessment. Because, for example, a couple of hours ago, I did an assessment with someone who had uh, knee pain, right? And I said, okay, can you can you stand on one foot? And he was like, the, he's a runner, right? Can you stand on the other one? He was perfect. And I was like, you cannot even stand. So that means when you walk, you've got problems. Imagine what's going to happen when you start running. So that's a movement related problem. Exactly. So, as we work through, and this is, I, I want people to appreciate this, right? Because what we try to do initially with Supple Leopard, the first part of the book is all about movement, right? Yeah. It's like, these are the principles of the f- human physiology expresses movement. We started in with the fascia, and that's the, war- the term we call sliding surface. It was really yeah. trying to look at our nerves running through tunnels, get intramuscular stiffness. Intramuscular stiffness is, the, is your skin just adhered to your body. And that's a problem, right? So we call the, you know, you know, that is a sliding surface issue. A thoracic um, compliance issue, can't take a breath, can't expand because your ribs are stiff, that's a joint capsule problem. Uh, Then we go into the movement and movement I will put as its own movement system. And again, what we've done as therapists is said, oh, here are these really low level exercises that we work with very detrained people or people just coming out of surgery Let's use them for performance. Like that is not, dude, stop it, right? But should you be obsessed with balance? Yesterday, my wife's like, we got to play ping pong. And I was like, no, I'm going to go stand on the slack line for 10 minutes. I've been in the car. I'm going to go fuck around. So even in my, I don't have a balance problem. My balance is insane. I can juggle on the slack line. I can stand on the slack line barefoot. I can bounce on the, like, I do a lot of obsessive work on one leg to make sure that this balance system is always good. That's a movement system, as we talked about coordination system. The last component I'll call the environmental system, which is your sleep, right? Which is your stress, which is your food quality, which is your, and what we haven't done is as physios, we're like, oh, you're stiff. It must just be a motor control problem, movement control. I'm like, could be, right? Most people do move like shit because they've never been taught before, right? And then they're like, oh, well, it's just you, how you're expressing your length of your femurs you run. I'm like, bullshit. Every take everyone's shoes off, they all run the same. Right. What is that? So, you know, what you're seeing is there are absolutely truisms. Does my running look different than your running? Yes. I'm built very differently. Are the principles the same? Yes. You might run at 96. I run at 92. Right. That's our optimal. Like there are some things you might land a little bit more on the ball of your foot. I land a little bit more midfoot. Right. Whatever the language is, you know, depending on the surface and the skill, et cetera, et cetera. But no one slams their heel to the ground when they run. Like that's not running. But now I'm in this environmental condition. I'm like, Show me you're sleeping. You you said sleep's important, but you didn't measure it. You didn't quantify it. You didn't validate it, right? You told me don't eat inflammatory. What, are the, what does that mean, right? You haven't looked at my diet as a physio. You haven't looked at my body composition as a physio, right? You, you say, you know, hey, let's, let's build a bigger cup and let's be less stressed. You gave me zero strategies to manage my stress and zero follow, follow up and accountability and follow alongs to deal with that. Right? So what you're saying is basically all these things are important. I'm not going to help you with any of them except tell you that you have a balance problem. And you may have discovered that this guy really sucked on his, on his left side or his right side, comma, his calcaneus was locked up and then that affected his balance or he doesn't balance there. And maybe just balancing was enough to upregulate the system. Great. The, uh, the role of the coach is to be it's able not- to spot and find out yeah. what the most, most Mike Boyle way in is, right? Exactly. And it's not about telling what they can do, but helping them get there. It's not like they've got too many stresses. We don't want to add more. We just need to explain. And that's where, where you said something about fear before in a way that when you don't understand something, fear comes in. If you un- make it easy so people can grasp what we're trying to say and how they can get to where they need to be, optimizing their health, health capacity. Because Stuart McGill said something once, a clinician's aim should be to expand your patient's bio- biological capacity, not to cross it. That's right. And, and now suddenly we can take Greg Lehman or Peter yeah. Sullivan or Adam Meekins and integrate those people into thinking, okay, we do need to build tissue tolerance, right? We just yeah. need to load. If you want a strong Achilles tendon, we can do all the balance work in the world, but unless you're 
decelerating isometric and accelerating, right? Eccentric, isometric, concentric loading. It's not Achilles. It's not an Achilles. Like, what are we talking about, right? You no. Know? And then you're like, okay, well, how do I work this into my patient, into their lifestyle in a way that makes them be able to integrate this and actually follow through? The dirtiest secret in all of the therapeutic language is actually adherence. People don't do what we both agree they're going to do. Steer consistency. I love it. And, um, you know, I think the idea here is I'm like, Oh, you think your system was great? Well, no one did your system, right? No, you didn't follow up. You didn't have a mechanism for following up. They didn't document it. They didn't prove it. I don't believe they did it. And now I'm to the place where that I'm like, someone has persistent pain or chronic pain. Explain pain. Dude, I've had so much pain theory at school. I've had so much postdoc pain theory. But now I'm also like, you need to get a tracker and I'm needing to see your sleep results. Because right? yeah. I don't believe you. I don't believe you that you're getting enough sleep. How do I know? Because my Olympians lie about their sleep and their job is to sleep, right? This is, you know, that's that's the place where we can really integrate and create simplified models where people can live their lives. They're not worried about their, you know, their macros. They're not worried about, like, for example, my favorite nutritional strategy right now is from a friend at optimize me nutrition and she has what we call the 800 gram challenge and she's like look the basis of your diet is i want you to eat 800 grams of vegetables and fruits a day they can be they can be cooked they can be frozen they can be raw doesn't matter 800 grams and what she's doing two things she's focusing satiety right so she's making people feel full right which is a problem when one of us like to overeat the second she's just spiked the crap out of nutrient density Third, oh, good. she doesn't tell you what you can't eat it's additive. Oh, I'm sorry. You don't have too many blueberries is the problem. You don't understand anything, right? So yes, car carnivore diet works. We build your gut health, right? It's the most strict elimination diet I know is the carnivore diet. I'm like, plant paradox? <laughs> Child's play. Just go ahead and go do the, the go do the carnivore diet. And I guarantee you, if you have an autoimmune condition, it's you do the plant paradox or carnivore, it's going to improve, right? Because it's a, such a strict elimination diet. But in the meantime, Let's go ahead and come back and talk about sustainability here, right? Exactly. And eating more vegetables and fruits is not going to poison you or shove too many, you know, fluoride bananas down your in your throat. So, you know, that's the idea where you make it easy for someone to adhere and you actually improve their quality of their life instead of making another checklist of bullshit low-level exercises that isn't inspiring doesn't have context or meaning and where someone can't see the direct results of inputs and outputs. That's that's what we need to get better at. How do I know it worked? In Supple Leopard, we're like test, retest. Intercession change is the most important, which means that a person needs to be independent because I'm not going to be able to see them all the time, right? Just that's the way the system works. The original Maitland model was I would see you three to five times a week. Imagine if you saw me for a pain-related knee problem three to five times a week. How would you feel for the first six hours after I saw you? Because now it's been 18 hours since I've said, dude, you would make massive progress. That's the future, right? That's the dream, but that's not the reality. So intra-session change is crucial. Inter-session change is the game. Amen. Amen, brother, to that. But it's what you started saying before that because people have to actually uh, pay the bills. They forget about what actually they're trying to do. Well said. Well said. So maybe you've been out of school for a year and then you start your own physical therapy practice at your gym. And, uh, you know, and you, I had a resource of people that I could call if I got over my head or something I didn't understand. I built a network, right? And what I saw was, I was like, this is ridiculous. I'm working my ass off and I made the clinic $482,000 this year and I got paid seventy thousand dollars as a first year studio you know and then they realized how much money i was making and they bumped me up every three months to eighty thousand dollars but i still made them four hundred thirty thousand dollars and this was 15 years ago Man. so so the idea here is i was like well you know what i'm going to just create a different solution for people and people started paying out of pocket because they got an hour of time they got text follow-ups. They got pictures follow-ups. That was a relationship, a coaching, learning, teaching relationship, not a transactional therapeutic relationship where I got 30 minutes to do an eval and 20 minutes for a follow-up. And in that time, I was asking the physio to understand everything they need to know about me, to watch me run, to watch me lift, to watch me in these fatigue states, right, to do follow-up, to talk – maybe it's like when you have a knee pain problem and you go see your doctor and she doesn't watch you run, that's the poor use of your physician. Maybe we're using our physios and chiros the wrong way. A hundred percent. And that's actually could be 
the death of the profession or the it, birth of the profession right exactly. you've been taking the square square peg and, and jam it into the round hole you know and that that's not enough you know um it's what you said before. it's you complicated need, if, if you're a physio or a chiro you need to know how to deadlift you need to know how to squat you know what i mean like try to don't be an asshole like come on yeah well and um and understand what, what what it is we're doing there because that's the formal language of reaching into the crib and picking up your baby and one of the things that I, I appreciate is that technique probably doesn't matter very much if my environment matters so much. If I'm well rested, if I eat foods, if I'm not inflamed, if I sleep a lot and I go slow and it's unloaded, it doesn't matter. But if I ever want to go loaded and faster, then I'm going to have to take the foot and make it straighter, yeah. right? If I, if I want to develop skills that you know, maybe you'll have a bunion, maybe you'll have a collapsed arch, maybe you'll develop plantar fascia, maybe you'll have an Achilles problem, maybe you'll tear your ACL when you jump and land, but maybe not. Or we can teach kids to jump and land and walk and run with their feet straight from early on because this is better human function. Uh -huh. And should you ever want to ride a bike with your feet straight or run with your feet straight or jump and land or ice skate with your feet straight, right, or ski with your feet straight, maybe we should train feet straight, right? And w instead of saying, it's all natural, it's just a natural problem solution, well, I'm like, well, that's a really good business model to create a whole bunch of dysfunction. And yeah. again, at low speeds, low loads, it likely matters less. And more importantly, should that be on your problem list, if that's the thing that you're trying to help someone with, hey, my knee hurts, okay, well, what's the, ther what's the minimum dose you can do to make your knee not hurt? Well, that's not the conversation we're interested in having. Tell me about your environment. Tell me what you're doing to be 100 years old. When we integrate the thinking of someone like Yuval Harari in here, and we look at Homo Deus and some of that thinking, we have to appreciate that we will be 100 years old. And there's a good likelihood in our generation. I, I have two women in my family right now, two, who are 100 years old. Wow. My, I have an aunt who was 101 who just died three weeks ago or four weeks ago. Oh, she fell. Uh, well, she, she was 101. She fell, broke her arm went to the hospital, right? She lived in the basement of my auntie's house. She lived independently, had a nurse who came in, she stayed in her home. She didn't really have that much pain in her arm. She had a humerus fracture, but that humerus fracture was enough to overcome her ability to heal and her vital capacity. She fractured her humerus. She was in bed. She, she said good night to her son. And then she went to sleep and never woke up again. Sorry, but that's the reality. We're all going to be hundred years old. The question is, what's it look like from 40 to 100? You know, how many preventable orthopedic problems could I have prevented? How much dysfunction? How many days of not picking up my kid, not playing basketball, being afraid, or not being able to explore my environment did I miss because someone said it didn't matter how I moved or that it was okay to, to not move or, right? And I, I think what we're seeing is, let me give us a grade again. F, we get an F. We, 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 have, we have people who are poorly prepared to be human beings. We've created a society that makes it so easy and rewards people. And, and we don't give people the tools to solve that problem. But now it's a national, national crisis. It's about national security and it's about social justice. So let's get off our asses and start making the changes because now we have the opportunity to have that conversation. And then brother to that. Um, Man, and that's you, got me, you got me fired up this morning. I had a bunch of coffee. I'm like, woo, dropping <laughs> F-bombs and going fast. Apologies send, to everyone. Send me that coffee, please. <laughs> What's your case? And then I'm going to go three, three uh, questions. I chose three questions from all the people that I've just posted the video on. What's your case on posture? I have a lot of people getting out there. It's like, oh, come on. Don't be that way with posture. And I was like, well, if you're like this, there's no way you can breathe properly. Spina says the worst posture is the one that you can stay for a long time because you need to keep moving because our bodies are, you know, they need to keep moving. And then I'm like, which I agree. Because people are like T-Rexes these days, like this is their position. But then I'm aware and I, I'm a person that wants people with good postures. Good postures for them. Neutral, natural postures. Well, well you, you, I just saw you back away. You're like, what about posture? And you're like, oh, posture is an individual thing that, you know, just is neutral and natural. Okay. What positions give you the most access to your physiology, right? And if you tell me that this is totally okay to sit with a rainbow shrimp, is this, again, are we making this about pain or making this about capacity? Because one of the things that we strip out, and remember, posture is the Latin word for position. So what you're really saying yeah. is spinal position doesn't matter. Well, what happens if I have a pelvic floor problem? We already talked about that. That's a postural issue. 
What if I clench my jaw? That might be a postural issue. What happens if I get tension headaches? That might be a postural issue, right? What happens if my jaw doesn't develop? That's a postural issue. What happens if I can't breathe? Well, maybe that's a postural issue. What if I can't create intra-abdominal pressure? Well, posture issue. What if I can't, right? What if I can't rotate? Well, posture issue. So what, what I'll tell you is if we take the pain, no pain out of it, because that was the, that was the rationale for improve your posture because you might be in pain. And, and I'm like, dude, as a young male, death did not scare me, right? Don't do that. You may die. Ooh, I may die. That's cool. Let's, let's, let's do let's that. Try. Right. Let's try that. Like, don't sit in that position. You may, you may have pain. Okay, what you yeah. Right? It. Like, I just carried my, you know, 30 kilo kayak for eight hours over the rocks to do this, do this one little section of class five. I'm not interested and worried about pain at this moment, especially when I'm 19 or 20. But if I get to the end of the end of my road or my grandma is in a flex posture and she sneezes and has a breast fracture, well, that's a problem, right? So if someone becomes extension intolerant because they've just been cranking over and, and don't get me wrong, when we say posture, what everyone thinks is flexion. When I think postural dysfunction, I'm less worried about flexion and way more worried about extension. Extension drives way more dysfunction. And by the way, the number of yogis I've seen with herniated discs, oh, with, rad, yeah. with rad posture. So when we go into Mel Siff's super training book, oh, a, Bible. He, has a, he has a great statement in there where he says, look, you'll see people, powerlifters and strength athletes with forward head on neck, into and rotated shoulders, but their posture is dysfunctional. And then some, and stable and rigid and, and healthy, and rock solid, and they may not be able to put their arms over their head, but they don't have to do that. But then you'll see people with rad posture who you give them a load and they fall apart, right? And or you ask them to breathe hard and they fall apart. So the real question is, you know, what we say is, you know, we're looking at being more mid-range around the spine because we have better function of the spine, right? So Philip Beach wrote a book called Muscles and Meridians, and I highly recommend it for every chiropractic student. Muscles and meridians. It's basically functional embryology. It'll blow your mind. If if embryology was taught in this way, we'd all love the embryology. Not not gone mad, right? Wolfie and Ridge, like, please. But you know, he describes the trunk as a radial contractive field, and its integrity and its design is to try to maintain the integrity of the tube and and length of the of the spinal cord. So one of the reasons that we really value better organized spine positions. And we've even tried to drop this language of posture because it's so loaded, right? Your grandma says, just you have bad posture. Like, what does that mean, grandma? Like, you can't even yeah. define that, right? My lumbar and your lumbar look different. So what are we talking about? Women have an extra wedged lumbar vertebra. So they're going to have different postures than men do. So do you even talk about that? So, you know, the key here is that if we appreciate this radial contractile field as a way of maintain the integrity of the spine, well, then I have this mid-range that gives me a lot of rotational capacity. But if you're going to surf or row or ride a bike, chances are you're going to be in a flex position. Yeah. Do you do any, you know, how well do you tolerate those flex positions? And more importantly, you start putting kinks in the system. Because as soon as I put a kink in the system, I start to see when I put an element of what we call a local flexion or extension moment in the spine, what we see is lost capacities. We see lost abilities to generate force. So now the conversation we're having is I'm like, dude, if you want to teach suckiness and poor intra-abdominal pressure and inability to breathe and poor diaphragm discursion and you want to ignore the realities of someone's chest breathing, neck breathing, postural dysfunction, passive accessory breathing, if that's what you're teaching, knock yourself out because I'm going to be over here saying these positions transfer to a lot better things. They handle larger axial loads. They translate into better hip function, right? We, we see fewer neuro, neurodynamic problems. So let's let's make this conversation about capacity and function and i can prove to you that your crappy doesn't matter function right postural organization postural positions suck because i can get you into a better position and i can show you can generate more force in those positions so again if you want to argue for about the primacy of you being in a less effective position i'll see you on the field and on the court right but once again we're not talking about pain. We're talking about no, no. But I do want to add, if you say make that statement, in 20 years or 30 years, someone has a problem, it's your problem. You own that, right? I think that's really interesting. You know, when, when women are carrying large loads on their head in third world countries, they have pretty organized spines to handle that axial load. When they spend time in the field, they don't just round. They are in a hip hinge. Why? Because 
you can't sustain a rounded back rainbow posture picking time. turnups for long periods of time. So yep. what you've said is, oh, this is a dead end solution. It doesn't matter. But I'm like, wouldn't it be better to train a solution that isn't dead ended, that opens, that transfers the more skills? And again, total choice. If you just want to eat curry and and uh, smash pizza and drink pints of Guinness, man, knock yourself out. It is your right. But don't tell me that's a better way. Exactly. And my, my thing is, I, I, following the research of Bragg about, he did a lot of research on the meninges and how posture has plays a huge role in the, as you said, about the capacity. And I said, if the capacity of the uh, CSF changes with posture, imagine what's going to happen in a bad position with load. How about a less effective position? Right. Yeah. We can even we can even inject that. That's exactly right. We start we start to appreciate all of that. So what are we training? Because what I want to do is prepare my kids to be able to go in the world and pick up a new sport quickly, to enjoy their bodies. What we need to do is and one of the things that we don't do as Kairos, and we definitely don't do as physios, is we don't own any bad outcomes. Yeah. Therapy, I'm like, what does that look like? Who who owns that? How do you track that? No one's tracking that. Someone just didn't come, right? Rarely do you like, oh, you know, the, the, inter the surgeons get immediate feedback if they have bad outcomes. Oh, you know, you had an infection, you had, you know, poor recovery, poor function, right? They, they get it. But we don't, you know. So, you know, how do, how do you know you had a bad coach? Like, I don't know. Uh, didn't progress very well. I, you know I mean? Like, I just didn't like him, you know. <laughs> You know, you know if you got a bad haircut right away. No, I, I, I think um, in these languages, what we're really showing is this is an artifact of academia. It's not predicated on, well, why do yogis teach this? What was Joseph Pilates doing? Why is this important to gymnastics? Why is it important to Olympic lifting? And so like the old trope that every physical therapist trope pulls out is when our world's strongest men are lifting 800, 900, 10,000 pound deadlifts, and they start to lose that position and round their upper backs. They're just like, see, flexion is totally normal. I'm like, well, how come you didn't see that when someone moved fast, right? You don't see it at all in the Olympics and Olympic lifting. You don't see it in gymnastics. You don't see it in, in Olympic sprinting. Why, why is Michael Johnson, you know, why is Usain Bolt? Why are they running in that position? So once again, I think there are a lot of cues about saying, hey, it, do, it, it matters for reasons that you don't think matter. And I think that's that's our fault for selling it the wrong way. You may get injured. You yeah. may sneeze and herniate a disc. Really? Well, then you were really a shitty system to begin with. We're so tangled with words like, you know what? Oh, anti-flexion, anti-this, anti-that. And what I always say is you cannot, like one of my mentors says, you cannot cheat biology. Whatever you can do, you cannot cheat biology. So same thing with function. I've got a really interesting question uh, from Magulus from Spain. He says, if you could go back in time, which are the things you would give a slap to yourself for? You know, I think we all are a little bit more um, austere in our thinking. Experience brings context. You know, um, a slap of just like, I didn't understand all of the context. You know, I had the moving parts. I understood this because I had been an injured athlete. I had, you know, but just appreciating the integration piece or even a little bit more really looking at this as a piece of behavior and then also i think you know in my first set of notes from 2008 i talk about breathing and parasympathetic activity um but there's a lot more to be done and appreciate what was trying to happen with yoga what was trying to happen with with some of the mysticism around breathing and not really appreciating the impacts that that uh, neurology neurobiology could have you know, I think when you start to see, you jump into Z Health, you know, what you're going to see is that, well, a lot of people you misuse Z Health for a long time, right? They, they use it as an excuse to stop training. But suddenly when you start to appreciate the brain as, as a tool to sense change in the environment and upregulating those things, then suddenly you can integrate those features right into your training and, you, you know, you get everything you want. And if you don't think it's important today, let me know how you feel after being on Zoom for eight hours a day. You know, that's... Yeah. Your brain is not designed to look at this flat two-dimensional screen. As I keep look, I keep talking to you, but I keep looking up far and then keep coming back and I keep looking up far so that I can stay engaged. So, you know, we shouldn't have to think about those things because our environment should be in inherently dynamic enough that I don't have to program this. Like, what do you mean you don't go outside? Here's a good example. Our daughter was born and uh, she was born premature. She was six weeks early. We're in the neonatal intensive care unit. She gets discharged finally after three weeks in the neo, 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 neo unit. And they're like, you need to give her these vitamins. She was breastfeeding. And I was like, seriously, I need to give my kid vitamins. 
And they were like, yeah, yeah, you've got to give me these vitamins. And I was like, look me in the eye and tell me that mother's milk is not complete nutrition. Go ahead. Just do it. I'll wait for it. And they were like, oh, yeah, it's super uncomfortable. And I was like, tell me what problem you're trying to solve. And they were like, there's no vitamin D in the milk because the mothers here in San Francisco don't go in the sun. So the mothers are all vitamin D deficient and their kids are all vitamin D deficient. So I was like, oh, so if I put my kid in the sun, I don't have to give her these vitamins? And they were like, that's correct. How much sun exposure? Any sun. The body is so good at it. So I just take my infant baby, put her in the sun, right? Don't have to give her vitamins. So it takes a minute to see all of this. And what I appreciate is, and the thing that I would do even more of, and I'm trying to do a better job of now, is keep pointing to the things I love. Like FRC is not a comp competitor. You know, they're, they're, he is trying to solve his own thing. And I, I will remind everyone that if you see someone being a dick on the internet, they have problems. So if you're seeing, they don't get to be big boys and big girls and join the conversation. So, um, you know, I think what's really appreciative is that if you were with a bunch of master swordsmen and, you know, you wouldn't see a master swordsman like making fun of someone's technique, they'd be like, well, you know, how, what, what's there to be learned here? So go jump into someone else's system, really try to understand what problems they're trying to solve. Take what's essential, reject what doesn't fit into your model. That's brilliant. I've got a really good chiropractor. Uh, he's going to be the guy that, for what we talked about for England, uh, Joseph from Manchester. I want to know if he thinks there's a perfect squat and why and how has his opinion changed over time? Good question. So, you know, the, cool really, the really the, the great question is what problem are you trying to solve, right? So let's talk about what squatting is. It's a short lever hinge hip hinge. So deadlifting is a long lever hip hinge. The difference between deadlifting and squatting is the degree of your knee bend and how where your torso position is, right? So here's a great example. Is there a perfect squat? So I had a bad ski accident six years ago and have two huge impact lesions where I put my femur through my tibia on my right knee, right? So we're always bone on bone, but this one is really bad. When I get into flexion, I have zero bumper. When I'm, an extend, when I'm a little bit more extended in a more long lever position, I have massive amounts of meniscus and great joint surfaces. So I can trap bar deadlift 600 pounds, but if I put, a, uh, if I put 60 kilos on my back and squat, you can hear the bone on bone action in my knee. I can swing a kettlebell, I can ride a bike, I can do a step up, I can row, right? But guess what? I lunge bone on bone and it feels, I can feel the bones grinding. I'm oh, probably, I'm going to get a, a total knee replacement because my knee swells up. I can't ski. I can't handle valgus load. So what movements now do I do? What, what perfect squat do I have? In order for me to squat without my knee feeling like sketchy, I have to basically verticalize my shin and let my torso come way forward. That's a highly ineffective squat to Olympic lift, right? So what you'll see is that there's a lot of muscle cleans in my life and a lot of strict pressing, but I do not push press and I can't push jerk anymore. So if my torso, if I have to engage in training where my torso has to be very upright and high knee demands, high knee flexion demands and ankle range of motion demands, like Olympic lifting, I can't do it, right? So the real question about the squat is, well, what are you, are you picking something off the ground? Is it on your back? Is it in your front? So suddenly when you move away from back squat, front squat to what what angle torso position are we in where's the load then all of a sudden you appreciate that the body will solve that set of problems based on your anthropometry not based on your unique snowflake hip the research doesn't support that everyone has a unique hip you know hip structure that's not that's not true and anytime you see a, a picture of retroverted hip show me the pelvis that went with it show me the tibial torsion that helped to unwind it what you're seeing is you're taking a snapshot of the system you're not looking at the whole thing right and you're also not appreciating wolf's law which is that bones and shapes remodel, function, yeah. right? So, so what I'm saying is, you know, I have a super, I'm six foot two, but I have a very narrow pelvis. How do I know? Because I've measured my ischial tuberosities against the norm, right? I, when I go and work with elite cyclists, we look at their pelvic width. That means when I squat, based on my anthropometry, I have a much more knees out position based on how fucking narrow my pelvis is. Watch this. My pelvis gets less narrow. I have less of, you know, this sort of knee out position. So your stance width is, is going to change. Your knee forward position is going to change. Your torso angle is, not gonna, is going to change. But what's not going to change is the pressure through your foot, your ability to express full hip flexion, your ability to have native ankle dorsiflexion, right? What happens if I have to pick something up but it's really wide? I better be able to squat wide. What happens if I have to squat down with my feet very close together, like on skis? I just I land and I have to compress all of a sudden, right? You know, we teach people to jump and land out of the airplanes with their feet together. Dude, that's a narrow foot together squat. Can you do that or not? Right? So 
you know, we teach children to jump and land that way. So the question is, you know, what would I go back and change around thinking about squatting? I would explain it in these terms. Do you have access to your native physiology? Because getting on the ground and getting up and down off the ground, that's pooping in the woods. That's working out by the fire. But you can't tell me your squat is the ideal squat based on your anthropometry because I'm going to change some variable and then your whole thing is bullshit again, right? No, no, hold, hold the weight here. Now hold the weight here. Now let's show me this position. Oh, oh, what you're saying is you didn't have any hip internal rotation. Your legs, your quads were stiff. You didn't have any hip flexion and your ankles were stiff in, in, in flexion. And so no wonder this is the only squat position you get it. I got it. You must be a unique snowflake. <laughs> Hope Joseph likes that. <laughs> Th three mentors that created or made a big difference in who you are today. Oof. Well, I'll tell you what, um, Greg Glassman, founder of CrossFit, introduced me to all of these movements, right? Set me up with a system that allowed me to learn myself. So as a system, right? Um, I don't get to spend time with Greg. I don't spend time with Greg. Um, Greg Cook is an incredible compatriot. Stuart, Stuart McGill, I re read his spine book when I was a young student. Kept it in the bathroom. I actually read it probably 30 or 40 times. That's why one of the reasons Supple Leopard is a spine first model. We use a spine first and central nervous system protection model, like organizing the spine and central nervous system, we think is the most important aspect of what it is we do. Right? Why do we look at breathing? Well, it's the first movement around the spine. The, sp the spine is the first engine. It's the, it's, the, it's the first primary engine, right? And then, you know, what I'll say is um, I do so much reading in other places that all of the, the writers and thinkers around the other fields, you know, that I get to spend time with, David Epstein from the sports team, really putting on genetics and, and yeah. making the case for understanding sort of that aspect and, and practical genomics. How am I without, uh, you know, Laura Moore Mosley and explain pain? You know, if, if he didn't stand up and really, and, and Butler, and really say, here's a different way of teaching this. You know, I learned that when I was a first year student, um, you know, all of the incredible coaches that I'm exposed to. I'd say the third group goes to the people that I get to collab with and my, my, my compatriots. That would be my third influence because I see so many bright, really fiercely intelligent people um, solving these sets of problems. You know, Mark Verstegen of Exos, I read about him when I was a young college student and remember thinking, I want to do this with my life. This is what I want to do. And, you know, now he's a friend. So, uh, you know, that's amazing. So what I'll say is that I have, there's an embarrassment of riches of people that I really, really value. And, 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 and I'm an obsessive reader. And that's my always, I, I, all my podcasts, all my videos are with, this, you know, finished with this question is like, which books, if you can, three, five books that you can tell me to read, which would they um, be? David, David Epstein's new book is called Range. And I would yeah, recommend it. It's about, about, yeah, yeah. It's about and I'll, I'll leave there because it's really about being a generalist. So be a savage generalist. Be so competent at understanding the systems and being able to, you know, one of my senior coach mentors, you know, could coach children. He taught his day job was to teach high school. And then he also would walk into his garage and at the gym and coach Olympic lifting Olympic athletes. Right. And the fact that he could speak on both sides was like, wow, I see the thinking and the linear aspect of his thinking. I can trace the skills that he's teaching this 14 year old girl all the way up and see the work done. And there's, so it's not like rehab language, sports performance. Those aren't two separate silos. It was a continuum. So for me, range is so important because it helps us be, become really, really good generalists and appreciate that our, I think thinking is valid when it scales across cohorts, when it goes across multiple disciplines, when it's independent of speed, skill, load age right when there's continuity in the thinking that's where we we want to be going and say okay that, that's get that's more closely to best practice and if you had to say dear consistency what would you add to that man don't be heroic be consistent i don't give a shit about heroic i give a shit about consistent really it is that's that's the thing um one of my best friends is a guy named matt vincent world champion highland games athlete incredible athlete you know, someone asked him how to get strong once. He's like, just lift, pick up something heavy once a week for 10 years. Let me know what happens. Let me know how that experiment goes for you. So consistency is the game. And remember, you can't win fitness. You're going to die. Your, your, your system's going to implode. So play better today. Control what you can control. And then don't worry about the rest. Go be a 
rad human being, not a human animal training. The ready state. Where are we going to see further with all the changes uh, and what's coming up? Well, you know, we uh, we're redesigning our app again, and uh, we've got some some big kind of fun projects and collabs coming out. Um, we're working on some new book projects. Look, we're, we're, we are because Julia and I are in constant growth mindset. You know, we're just working. We're refining, seeing what people's needs are, working better. You know, working at the limits, and uh, you know, trying trying to make this a sustainable, fun idea. What we've tried to do on the if you've never been to our site before, and if you go to thereadystate.com/slash science by bros. Is it bros, bros by Science? I'm sorry. Bros, bros of Science, yeah, yeah. Bros of Science. We've created, uh, there's a two-week on-ramp program. So you can have a two-week trial of the site, see if it helps you solve your problems. But also we've, we've worked hard on, for people who've never had an experience, giving them two weeks of being able to learn how to do basic care on themselves. So what we realize is, hey, we may lose people after two weeks, but at least we've leveled up the game. So we give you a, a video a day, some micro learning, teach you how to do some self care. And again, if it's just a stiffness problem, you'll figure it out. Excellent. Kelly, thank you so much for your time. That was excellent. And My pleasure. Thank you. Looking forward to um, seeing you close soon. I need to go back to Borough Market. And, uh, you know, uh, there's Monmouth Coffee is there. And, oh, uh, my man. But I'm going to take you to different places because there, uh, when was the last time you were here? It's been a minute. It's been a few years. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm down. But, you know, sausage roll, cup of Monmouth, that's, that's pretty hard to beat. My, my kids love the UK. We may be back there in December, January. So we'll, uh, we'll connect for sure. And, uh, you know, I always say that, I, you know, London is my favorite town. Paris is my favorite town. You know, but uh, secretly, I love London. Perfect. And then maybe Athens could be our next stop. Sounds great. Looking Thank forward you, to it. Thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Cheers. Have a good one.